I think Harold Bloom was always talking about this, the like that like a really great work of art for it to really take hold needed to be strange. What's so funny that you mentioned Harold Bloom. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I think it has, because of the corona and everything, I don't think we really hung out together since he died. I still don't know that I actually like have taken in that he's dead, actually. Yeah. Wait, I, that, you say that to me and I'm like, that's right, he died. Exactly. Trump, it didn't, he doesn't fit with the whole new reality. He doesn't fit with the whole new reality. He definitely doesn't, but that's really interesting because it's like, it happened and I was like, this is so monumental in a way that I just can't even like process it. But you, knew, you must have known him from a child or- He was like one of my father's best friends. Yeah. He was Some there. book I own, he dedicated to your father and it Very says fun. like to my greatest friend ever. No, so. no, you're right. He Archie dedicated Mann. something to him. It was some kind of funny thing like to my liege or something yeah. like that. It was a, <laughs> My liege lord, or something. Like no, to my bosom friend, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, to my, to my, as Byron to his Shelley, or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's so ridiculous. Like, but was that guy like hanging around your house? Yes, and that's the wow. thing. What's funny? To I think maybe you got a lot from him. <laughs> oh, I, oh no, I definitely did. I suddenly oh, realized no, I that. definitely did. Oh no, there's yeah. no question about it. I totally did. And that... <laughs> <laughs> that thing I did in Planet of the Apes, I was consciously thinking of Harold Bloom something. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, he is like a big orangutan. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, and I was sort of, he was like an orangutan. He really was? Yeah, that I think of that. And I was totally thinking of him occasionally because there were times in that where I was very kind of like, oh, my dear, oh, my dear, like kind of being really like, and I was totally thinking of him. I think I got a, yeah. I definitely think. <laughs> oh, because I mean, he's such an actor. Actually, the guy was. Such a I saw that because I studied with him in two uh, uh, periods of my life, and I noticed he told the same goddamn joke, exactly memorized the same lines, flowed out spontaneously. It was quite interesting. It was much more, but it was still great. Definitely a perf. He was definitely a perf. Yeah. Yeah. You had him in graduate school as well as undergrad. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I took a class in college called Originality, which was about oh, yeah. him, and it was like I still can't That's right. really, yeah, yeah. really say exactly what it was about. And but I mean, it had a lot of that anxiety and influence stuff in it. And that's interesting because he had that whole. Have you read that book that he wrote? He wrote a science fiction I, novel, right? I the fuck it's no, I, I did see. I've seen it. That is also the kind of thing that you would actually find. Once in a while, a very good use bookstore oh, too. Like, but it was, it was pretty um, interesting that he did it. I mean, how cool that he did it. And I think he got a lot of shit for it. I think, like for instance, like I even think my father mocked him for it. Oh really? Because it was sort of science fiction, and and it was total science fiction. It's supposed to be good, but you know, what was a big interest? It's supposed to be good. I think it is actually supposed. Oh to wow. Be good. I've only heard it's like mocked. You know, the big influence on it is um, Voyage to Arcturus. Ah, oh, that's right. David Lindsay, Voyage David to Arcturus. Lindsay. Wow. But he was super into, and I- Really? I had heard him talk about that's it. That's a surprise. And that's when I was in Whitlock's books, great used bookstore. Okay, yes. And, and Wait, the was, one in the city or the book bar? No, the one in the city, the one that was called okay. the barber shop. <laughs> yeah, so sure, okay. And it was that great one with the old guy who ran it that was like, yeah, oh, that guy was, and yeah, he, he's out of a Dickens world or something. Totally. And I remember going up in there and, and I was in graduate school. I was in my second year of, third year of graduate school. And I was like, oh, this book, I've heard of this book. Why have I heard of this book? We're talking about a book, that's still a book that is completely um, marginalized still. The world has not ready for that to be, <laughs> to be a mainstream. It's being a little rediscovered. Okay, yeah. Like Penguin is gonna do, I think. Oh, finally, yeah. And it's like, so people- Now is that the same, was he part of that scene with Tolkien and C.S. Lewis? No, he was totally, he was like a, an accountant or something. He decided he wanted to be, he was Scottish and he wanted to be a writer. And he had all, and he wrote Voice Dark Tourist, which was a, kind of a sensation. People were like, wow. Really? Yeah. yeah. It, I, I was like that when you told me to read it. <laughs> and he kind of 
couldn't, and then he just kept writing these weird books and he was super marginalized and they made no money and they got hammered by people. And were the others anything close to the genius really of Arcturus? Weird. I've read I've read a bunch of the other ones, and they're really weird. And he died. This I know. He died because he got some kind of he had like an abscess tooth that he wouldn't get <sighs> dealt with. What a, a voyage to Tooth Tartarus. Well, there's part where he. Well, there's like a seance at the beginning, right? Yeah. It starts off with this sort of 19th century science fiction. Yeah. Right. Seance. Yeah. Right. And you and during that, the man leaves. I don't. Is that when he travels to? I can't remember, but somehow. Seance and something comes from another dimension, but it's not a ghost. It's like a space traveler or something. He yeah. Out and then he, then he gets, then he goes outside and gets caught up with some weird figure who takes him to a rocket. Which is okay, a stone yeah. power, but it's a rocket or something. And then he goes to fucking. And all these adventures happen, but then at some weird vision he's having on this other planet, Arcturus, yeah. he suddenly is called by someone at a seance, and it's the same seance that he was at. And he so well is, done. He is what shows up. Exactly. Shows up. So he is yeah. what shows up at the same I've never Again, seen was, that pulled off more triply in literature. In the 30s, but he yeah. also had the whole thing where there's the whole, there's the creature in it that is a, like a um, uh, third sex in it. There's a creature. That's right, it. yeah. There's a whole like a system of, of language. With all these j different gendered creatures. That's right, gender terms. All these different words for how what you call them and so. Way ahead of his time on that one, yeah. The crazy vision at the end where he's back in the tower and he keeps walking up the tower and he keeps coming to a circular window. And every time he looks through it, do you remember this? He keeps seeing the weird vision of all the little green, like. Yeah, of course I remember. I remember it's so, it's so visual, right? The book, it's such, but it's with colors that don't exist. They're, right. They're, it's it's kind of colors that yeah. don't exist. And they, he can't describe the colors because they don't exist on Earth and and the sounds that don't exist on Earth. And like, but but I think that I remember reading that Bloom was into it because he saw it as a, um, the, the whole philosophy of it was essentially uh, Gnostic thing. And that it okay. was all about this kind of, because he keeps, he has this whole thing where he keeps hearing a heartbeat from uh, from the sky, but it's also in him, and it's like this whole weird Gnostic thing. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it had some. Ex I mean, because where the hell did they, if it's just some kind of science fictional vision? Where the hell did it come from? I don't know, but I mean, I, I mean, I hope there's an explanation. I think that's the thing people talk about with that guy is that it's like he was like a, a clearly just some weird ass visionary who was totally yeah. Like, and yeah. like, you know, he had some crazy fucking vision. And but it's still quite powerfully done. Like, it's still elegantly done as a novel of that time and that era. It's really, great. I mean, it's it's up there with the Olaf Stapleton stuff, which it is. is so great, too. It's a great book. But anyway, that was that was Bloom. And that, that was because of... Yeah. But, but you're right. I did know. I mean, I knew Bloom as a little kid. I mean, right. like, you know, Bloom would be in our house just to come. And you were probably like on his knee. And he was like, oh, my child. Oh, my child. <laughs> oh, my child. And we, he would call, we had to call him. We, he would say, Uncle Harold. And he would call and he oh. would always just be like, is Papa home? He would call and be like, oh, Papa. <laughs> And like, he was just bizarre. He but I once, I remember seeing him walking down the middle of the, the street in the city with his like papers, like just head in the air. Like, Man. I mean, this is at the height, late when he was quite well known, you know, the guy was just, <laughs> yeah. totally. actually uh, the first time I went to the Shakespeare class I took, I was the first one there. Did I tell you this? Said, uh, oh no, tell me. There was this man in there, and I had never, I didn't know, this was pre-internet, so I mean, I didn't really know who Harold Bloom was. And I was like, why is there a homeless man? <laughs> I feel sorry for this guy, but he, I really thought I was like gonna have to, that security was gonna come in and take this guy out. And, and I gradually realized as people came in and his like eyebrow lifted and a spark in his eye and he saw some like attractive young student came in. No, I can remember one of the funniest things with him because it's like I knew him and it was fine. I, like I, I understood how 
eccentric he actually was, but I do think you're right. A lot of it was like super cultivated eccentricity. I mean, it was like he was, yeah, you know, yeah, like, you know. And but anyway, it was hard to get into his class. Yeah. Yeah. The first class was packed with people and people wanted to get in and then he would only have a certain amount of people in the class and people at the end of the class were crowding around him to like talk to him to try to be like, right. and I was sort of standing on the edge because I hadn't seen him in a long time. And it right. was like, I hadn't seen him in a while and I just actually wanted to say hello to him. I was like, if I don't get in the class, whatever. And he saw me, he saw me and he goes, oh, oh my darling, oh. Oh, and he starts pushing through all these people and they're all looking at him like, what the fuck? And he comes up and he goes, hold me, hold Uncle Harold. Oh. And he puts his head on my chest and he just rests his head on my chest and he starts holding me. And everybody was like, what the fuck is going on? But the funny thing is that I have this story and I've read this story in other versions being told by other people. So I don't know whether my story was picked up by other people or whether he did this all the time because I had to write a paper about Moby Dick and I went to his office and he was sitting, he was sitting there and he was kind of giant. I mean, you know, he was, he was like Dr. Johnson or something too, which I, and he, I think he consciously played up like I'm Dr. Johnson kind of. Thing. I think so too. I think he definitely, in fact, I am, um, I became more interested in Dr. Johnson yeah. because of him. Yeah playing him up so much. And then I, and then I read Johnson and it was like, holy oh. moly. And so I can remember going and sitting there and talking to him and talking to him about Moby Dick. And he was sort of sitting there and he's very like, oh yes, my dear, oh my darling, it's wonderful. Oh yes, Ahab, oh. Death and Zumba, 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 Zumba. He kept saying Zumba all the time. And then <laughs> I noticed he was saying, he would go, ah, oh, death and Zumba, Zumba, like that. And he was always saying that. And I was finally said to him, like, what is, what is Zumba? This is, a, this is a side story. And he said to me, well, one time he was with Robert Thompson, Professor Thompson. And Robert Thompson was talking about Zumba and, you know, Zumba. And, 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 and Bloom said to him, Oh, my dear Robert, what is Zumba? And Robert Thompson said, it's a Yoruba word, West Africa. And he said, it's, it's energy, man. It's energy. When you've got Yoruba, when you've got Zumba, you can stick it through a brick wall, baby. Like, <laughs> that was the story he told. And, and then Bloom tells me that story about Robert Thompson. I was going to say it came from Robert Thompson when yeah, you kept saying it. Like, I was like, that's weird. So he was sitting around talking about like death and Zumba. He would just say that. Bloom would just say death and Zumba as like a little phrase. And so then he said, and then he started talking to me about how, about Ahab. And he said, I suppose we could say that in a sense, Ahab has lost his Zumba, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> also the kind of like yeah. slightly oh. sort of risque. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of kind of juicily, sort of off color like this. And he was, and, but anyway, as he was talking, as I was talking to him, I was sort of like, spinning out some bullshit because I hadn't really thought about the paper that much. And he got up and started walking around the office, kind of running his hands along the spines of the books and kind of going, eh, eh. Dreamily, very sort of dreamily. And he had no shoes on, he had his socks on. And he kept sort of nodding and kind of doing this sort of, mm, with his eyes closed like he was listening to music. And it was sort of very like, eh, eh. and he sort of went over to the door and he opened the door and he kind of gestured to me to follow him. And I was like, all right, so I got up and followed him. He was sort of shuffling along with the, sort of the socks on and it is like, oh, very <laughs> interesting. And we kind of went down and we ended up in the bathroom and he went into the bathroom and I walked in the bathroom with him and he went into the stall and he closed. And you had to talk about your paper? Talk about my paper while he took a shit in the stall. <laughs> And it was just like, he just took it down. <laughs> and it just sort of came out. And, he, and then we just kept, and we went back to his office. But I can imagine Dr. Johnson being like, you know, blah, 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 and then just like. Oh, of course. Yeah, he probably had a bowl right next to his yeah, chair. Like, yeah, going over to the chamber pot. And thinking, <laughs> yeah. well, he's like, they oh. just don't mention that in Boswell, but it's I'm sure. Just like, you know, we're having a conversation. We don't need to stop. We can. Yeah, keep exactly. Yeah. I'm just going to take a shit while we're having the conversation. You know, he was like one of those crazy Kabbalist rabbi guys you read about in the Middle Ages or something. And the whole idea of kind of like secret knowledge and like art and stuff like that. But it is true. He wasn't, he wasn't taking into account anything about like 
you know, Murakami, I'm sure, is not somebody he would have approved. But I, I, I thought it was very hilarious what he said about um, Harry Potter. I actually kind of don't disagree with him about that. <laughs> like, I mean, I've never read Harry Potter myself, Bill. Well, in fact, he was but I was a librarian when it came out, and I was astonished to see so many at a college how many everyone was oh, lined up to take every volume of. And it's, it, but his point was that it was a lot of kind of like invention without anything underpinning it. It's like lots. Of I mean, that's that's the nice part. <laughs> that would be the nice part of the text. <laughs> He climbed into the embrasure. His feelings translated themselves into vision, and he saw a sight that caused him to turn pale. A gigantic, self-luminous sphere was hanging in the sky, occupying nearly the whole of it. This sphere was composed entirely of two kinds of active beings. There were a myriad of tiny green corpuscles, varying in size from the very small to the almost indiscernible, they were not green, but he somehow saw them so. They were all striving in one direction, toward himself, toward Muspel, but were too feeble and miniature to make any headway. Their action produced the marching rhythm he had previously felt, but this rhythm was not intrinsic in the corpuscles themselves, but was a consequence of the obstruction they met with. And surrounding these atoms of life and light were far larger whirls of white light, that gyrated hither and thither, carrying the green corpuscles with them wherever they desired. Their whirling motion was accompanied by the waltzing rhythm. It seemed to Nightspore that the green atoms were not only being danced about against their will, but were suffering excruciating shame and degradation in consequence. The larger ones were steadier than the extremely small. A few were even almost stationary, and one was advancing in the direction it wished to go. He turned his back to the window, buried his face in his hands, and searched in the dim recesses of his memory for an explanation of what he had just seen. Nothing came straight, but horror and wrath began to take possession of him. On his way upward to the next window, invisible fingers seemed to be squeezing his heart and twisting it about here and there, but he never dreamed of turning back. His mood was so grim that he did not once permit himself to pause. Such was his physical distress by the time that he had clambered into the recess that for several minutes he could see nothing at all. The world seemed to be spinning around him rapidly. When at last he looked, he saw the same sphere as before, but now all was changed on it. It was a world of rocks, minerals, water, plants, animals, and men. He saw the whole world at one view, yet everything was so magnified that he could not distinguish the smallest details of life. In the interior of every individual, of every aggregate of individuals, of every chemical atom, he clearly perceived the presence of the green corpuscles. <laughs> 